Um, welcome to the session two, actually sub session two one, um, on advanced basic research in mathematics and physics. Uh, our, the, we, we all, this afternoon we are this afternoon we are going to have uh, three talks, and uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the, our first speaker, which is uh, Hugh Wooden from Harvard University, with the title "Beyond the Infinite." Well, thank you all. Is this working? Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Um, I will be. I'm a mathematician. I'm also in the philosophy department. This will be a mathematical talk, um, but I'll try to keep the definitions to a minimum. So my specialty is set theory. That's where we study mathematically the infinite. And one could always start with this quote from Manin about set theory. That it was created, of course, by Cantor in a span, well, you can read it. And is it art or is it science? So I leave that for you to determine. OK, so that's my title. I seem to be at the end of the talk. I seem to be missing out there. Counterintuitive. Okay, any study of the infinite, we begin with the ordinal numbers. Those are a generalization of the counting numbers you all learned about. But in the universe of sets, everything is a set. So zero is the empty set, that is the set with nothing in it. One is the set whose only member is the empty set, and so forth. So this is how we define the counting numbers in set theory. But we can go beyond the finite. That's the whole point. And this defines the ordinal numbers, a transfinite generalization of the counting numbers. And in general, if alpha is an ordinal, it's just the set of all smaller ordinals. And uh, how do you get the next biggest ordinal? Well, if alpha is an ordinal, you form a new set where you add alpha itself as a new member. That's alpha plus one. So that's how we think of the ordinals. So in set theory, there's an infinite ordinal. That's what distinguishes set theory from number theory. And omega denotes the least infinite ordinal. So in the universe of sets, we're studying the infinite. A basic conception is that of the power set. If you have a set x, the power set of x is a collection of all subsets of that set. And it is a formal axiom or intrinsic to the conception of the universe of sets that the power set exists for all sets. And then with the ordinals and the power set, you can, by transfinite induction, unravel the universe of sets into stages. These are called the V-alphas, where alpha is an ordinal. So this construction starts modestly. V0 is just the empty set. And then how do you get V alpha plus 1? Having gotten to V alpha, you just take the power set. And then what do you do at limit stages? You just take the union of everything you've already defined. So this is really the defining conception of the universe of sets, much as 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot is the defining conception for the integers. And based on this conception, you can back out the formal axioms. Now, that's not how it was done historically, but that's the modern view. Uh, if x is a set, x belongs to V alpha for some alpha. That's part of the conception. And that becomes an axiom. OK, so the universe of sets, the vast and mysterious place, is nicely layered for us. So if you want to understand the universe of sets, why not just go level by level? Well, the empty set's not too difficult to understand. And that's V0. V1 has just the empty set in it. That seems pretty clear. And that's V2 there. V3 has four elements in it. V4 has 16 elements in it. That's manageable. 
V5 has 65,536 elements. Maybe that's not quite so manageable. V sub 1,000 has a lot of elements. Can't write the number down. V omega is infinite. It's the set of all hereditarily finite sets. So V omega is really the same as number theory. So what takes one from number theory to the infinite uh, is the power set axiom and the existence of V omega. So repeating the conception of V omega uh, if that were your universe of sets, that's mathematically identical to number theory. But we go far beyond V omega. Now we can add new axioms to the formal axioms, which are the ZFC axioms. And these axioms assert the existence of very large infinite sets. So the conception of the V alphas basically gives you the ZFC axioms I'm cheating a little, there's the axiom of choice, which isn't obviously true based on the conception of the V alphas. And then uh, we can assert the, add new axioms that assert the existence of large cardinals, in other words, very large sets. And here's some of the large cardinals of modern interest. I have a favorite one there, um, but these, there are many. And the names are not necessarily very uh, interesting or, or descriptive. OK, so some simple sets. We're studying infinity. Some simple sets from mathematics, where you have the set of all counting numbers. That, in some sense, is the simplest infinite set. You have the set of integers. Those are all of the positive and negative uh, counting numbers. And then you have the set of rationals. And then you have the real numbers. And then you have, say, the plane, all the points in the plane. These are five infinite sets that you encounter in school. Now, uh, cardinality is measuring the size of sets. For finite sets, that's a simple notion. But you have to be a little careful how you set things up when dealing with the infinite. But the intuition of when sets have the same size is the correct one. So two sets, X and Y, have the same cardinality if there's a matching of the elements of X with the elements of Y. Formally, we write cardinality of X equal cardinality of Y if there's a bijection between them. Remember, we can only talk about sets, but functions are sets, so this makes sense in the context of set theory. So if we go back, if you look at the counting numbers starting at 0, that infinite set has the same cardinality as the counting numbers starting with 1. And the bijection is just add 1. And this already shows you an unintuitive or perhaps surprising property of infinite sets. If you have an infinite set and you remove a point, the size can stay the same. If we could do that with all sets, uh, that would be a very useful thing. So if we go back to our simple sets, the counting numbers, the integers, and the rationals, even though they look like they're very different, they all have the same size. Turns out that the cardinality of the real numbers is the same as the cardinality of the points in the plane that's not obvious at all, because the line somehow seems so much smaller than the plane. But the point is, is that we're just talking about cardinality. We're not talking about other mathematical properties, such as topology. Now, it's assuming the axiom of choice, which is one of the ZFC axioms. For every set x, there's an ordinal, such that the cardinality of x is the cardinality of that ordinal. And now we come to the defining question of set theory. This is how it all began, uh, the question of the continuum hypothesis. So it, that story begins with Cantor's theorem that if you take the set of natural numbers and the set of real numbers, they do not have the same cardinality. So infinity comes in different sizes. 
uh, contrary to what one might intuitively think, that all notions of infinity are the same. And then a natural question arises. If you have an infinite set of real numbers, must it either be of cardinality the natural numbers or have cardinality that of all the real numbers? In other words, is there an infinite size between the infinity of the natural numbers and the infinity of the real numbers? The assertion that it doesn't, and that's what I've written here, that's Cantor's continuum hypothesis. The continuum hypothesis holds for the simple infinite sets, and it holds for many not so simple sets. So that's some intuition for it. So uh, what about continuum hypothesis in mathematics? In 1900, at the Second International Mathematical Congress, Hilbert posed his now famous list of 23 questions to guide mathematics for the coming century. The problem of the continuum hypothesis was the first problem on the list. In 1904, at the Third Congress in Heidelberg, Koenig gave a lecture where he claimed to solve CH. Generated a lot of excitement. All the parallel sessions were canceled, so everyone could attend Koenig's lecture. The announcement was a sensation widely reported by the press. I don't think that would happen now. The Grand Duke Frederick I of Prussia had Felix Klein, a famous mathematician, explain the entire matter to him personally. I don't think well, the proof was wrong. Many others tried to solve the continuum hypothesis and failed. Hilbert thought he had a proof for two years. And the problem of the continuum hypothesis quickly came to be widely regarded as one of the most important problems in all of modern mathematics. In 1940, Gödel showed that it's consistent with the axioms of set theory that the continuum hypothesis be true. So one can't refute the continuum hypothesis. And then, in a defining moment in 1963 on July 4th, Cohen announced in a lecture at Berkeley that it's consistent with the axioms of set theory that the continuum hypothesis be false. So you can't hope to prove the continuum hypothesis. And for those of you not from the U.S., it's an amusing date that Cohen chose. That's Independence Day in the U.S. And Cohen's theorem shows that the continuum hypothesis is independent of the axioms of set theory. You cannot prove it, and you cannot refute it. I want to say a little bit about Cohen's method. I'll be brief. If M is a universe of set theory, then M contains blueprints for virtual universes which enlarge M. These blueprints can be constructed and analyzed within the universe M, that initial universe. If M happens to be countable, then every, every blueprint constructed within M can be realized as a genuine enlargement of M. Cohen proved that every universe contains a blueprint for an enlargement in which the continuum hypothesis is false. And Cohen's method can also be used to show that every universe contains a blueprint for an enlargement in which the continuum hypothesis is true. That was not Cohen's, uh, Gödel's method. Uh, Cohen discovered an amazingly powerful technique for taking a, a mathematical structure which looks like the universe of sets and generating a new one with great control over what's true. Uh, these enlargements preserve large cardinal axioms, uh, if those axioms hold for a proper class, including all the axioms I wrote down earlier. So if large cardinal axioms can help, it can only be in some unexpected way. So you can't hope that measurable cardinals, for example, settle the continuum hypothesis for you. The extent of Cohen's method is not just about CH. In the 60 years since Cohen discovered the method, it's been vastly developed. Many problems have been shown to be unsolvable, even problems outside of set theory. It's a serious challenge to the very conception of mathematical infinity. Uh, the continuum hypothesis is just a statement about V omega plus 2. So it's way at the bottom in the cumulative hierarchy. So things look like they're unraveling at the bottom. Now, one could say it's time to give up. 
Large cardinal axioms are not provable by Gödel's second incompleteness theorem, but large cardinal axioms are falsifiable if they lead to a contradiction. So I will make my usual bold uh, prediction. No contradiction from the existence of infinitely many wooden cardinals will be discovered within the next thousand years. Not by any means whatsoever. We contact extraterrestrials who've been doing mathematics for a billion years. They won't have that proof. The physicists build for us an NP-complete machine, an oracle, and we ask the oracle. You won't get the proof. That's the prediction. So such truth, if it is in fact a truth, now the prediction I made, whoops, I'm trying to go backwards. This prediction, we're going to know in a thousand years whether or not it's correct or not. I'm making a prediction about our world a thousand years from now. It's, this isn't some abstract prediction. This is a prediction about the world. Okay, these truths cannot be proved. Well, that prediction could be proved. We wait a thousand years. But this suggests there is a component in the evolution of our understanding of mathematics which is not formal, which is not based entirely on proofs. The consistency of the theory, that falsifiable statement, cannot be proved. But yet, it's a, if it is true, it is a truth of mathematics. So mathematics isn't just calculation. An infinitely powerful computer isn't going to help you. But then the skeptical assessment that the conception of the universe of sets is incoherent must be wrong. How else can these predictions be explained? No one has come up with another method. The, exi the existence of wooden cardinals is consistent because they exist in the, world, in the universe of sets. What other explanation is there? No one has come up with one. But now the skeptic can turn the tables. But then CH has to be true or false. If the, if the conception of the universe of sets is judged to be coherent to the extent that it's justifying these predictions about very big sets, then it has to have full information about small sets. And the continuum hypothesis is a statement about very small sets. Okay, so we have to go back to the continuum hypothesis. What is, uh, what's the resolution? Is CH true or false? Perhaps we should begin by trying to more, under, more deeply understand the problem. Well, let's look at special cases. But does that really make sense? And it turns out it does. So uh, the continuum hypothesis, well, so we define a subset of V omega plus 1 to be a projective set if it's logically defined in the structure of V omega plus 1 with a membership relation. That's really the reals. And then we can extend this to relations. A relation, a binary relation on V omega plus 1 is projective if, if it can be defined formally within the structure of V omega plus 1. So we have the continuum hypothesis really is the following statement. If you have a subset of V omega plus 1 which is infinite, then either A and V omega have the same cardinality, V omega has the same cardinality as the counting numbers, or A and V omega plus 1 have the same cardinality. V omega plus 1 has the same cardinality as the reals. So this is a statement about all subsets of V omega plus 1. So we can localize this to the projective sets and just restate the problem. Suppose A is an infinite projective set, then either A and V omega have the same cardinality, or there's a bijection from V omega plus 1 to A, where that bijection is itself a projective set. So we're just localizing our universe to the projective sets. So this is a statement about the simple sets. We can do the same with the axiom of choice. So if you have a subset of x cross y, a function from x to y is a choice function for a, if for every a, little a, 
If there's a B such that AB belongs to big A, then AF of A belongs to big A. The axiom of choice asserts that for every uh, such set A, there's a choice function. Well, we can localize, well, so the axiom of choice was part of Hilbert's first, in a stronger form, was part of Hilbert's first problem. Okay, the first part asks whether, in some sense, the axiom of choice holds for all subsets of R cross R, as I said, in a very strong form, and that is the second part that asks whether CH is true or not. Well, we can localize this to the projective sets and get the projective axiom of choice. Suppose A is a relation on D omega plus one, which is projective, then there is a function, a choice function, which is also projective. So we just do exactly what we did with the continuum hypothesis. There were many attempts in the early 1900s to solve both the projective continuum hypothesis and the problem of the projective axiom of choice. Achieving success, non-trivial success, for many of the simplest instances. But by 1925, these problems both looked hopeless. They were. The actual constructions of Gödel and Cohen used to show that the continuum hypothesis wasn't solvable actually shows that the projective continuum hypothesis and the projective axiom of choice are unsolvable. So the, the practitioners in the early 1900s, those partial results they obtained were best possible. And the wall they ran into was a serious obstacle. The full-blown power of set theory doesn't help you. In Gödel's universe for set theory, it's called L, the projective axiom of choice holds and the projective continuum hypothesis holds. In the Cohen enlargement of L, as given by the actual blueprint which Cohen defined for the failure of CH, the projective axiom of choice is false and the projective continuum hypothesis is false. This explains why these problems were so difficult. So things are really looking serious now and challenging our conception of the infinite. This, we've localized the continuum hypothesis to a very simple case, and we hit the same barrier, but not quite. The intuition that these problems are solvable was correct. And this is the unexpected. A theorem in 1984, suppose there are infinitely many wooden cardinals, those are those very large sets, then the projective continuum hypothesis is actually true. The existence of very large infinite sets, which one would think has no bearing on the real numbers, has tremendous influence on the real numbers. So much influence that you get the projective continuum hypothesis. And then a year later, Martin and Steele showed that if there are infinitely many wooden cardinals, then the projective axiom of choice holds. So you answer both questions. Now, in fact, the Martin Steele theorem showed something quite a bit more, which I will not discuss. And I think it's fair to say the complete solution it really is beautiful. We have the correct conception of the omega plus one and the projective sets. The conception yields axioms for the projective sets. These determinacy axioms, in turn, are closely related to and follow from large cardinal axioms, wooden cardinals in this case. What about V omega plus two? All of this was about V omega plus one, and if you want to answer the continuum hypothesis, you have to move up to V omega plus two. One more step. Looks very, very difficult. But then you can't stop there. You need a, a, a conception of V itself. So this looks like a long road. It took 30, 40 years to get the right theory of V omega plus one. Do we have to wait another 40 years or 100 years to get the right conception of V omega plus two? And then what about V? Do we have to wait an infinite amount of time? So, by generalizing the projective sets, one obtains an axiom. V is ultimate L. And the L here is a related to Gödel's universe, but it's an ultimate version. 
this axiom settles the continuum hypothesis and much more. This axiom sharpens the conception of V, the universe of sets, to the point of rendering Cohen's method completely powerless. So not only does this axiom solve all of the axioms, things like CH, augmented by large cardinal axioms, it basically solves all the questions which Cohen's method has been used to show are unsolvable. So more precisely, any Cohen blueprint for the axiom V is ultimate L must be trivial. But is V is ultimate L the missing axiom for V? Well, there's a series of number theoretic conjectures now. These are the ultimate L conjectures. So these are questions which have answers. If the ultimate L conjectures are true, then the axiom V is ultimate L is arguably the key missing axiom for V. If the ultimate L conjectures are false, then the program to understand V by generalizing the success in understanding V omega plus one and the projective sets fails. We have to start all over. Now, it's important to emphasize that the ultimate L conjectures aren't like CH. They're, they're, they're number theoretic statements. In fact, they're existential number theoretic statements. I'm not going to show they're independent. If they're independent, they're true. So uh, any reasonable conception of mathematical truth will have to take a position on the ultimate L conjectures. Now, I don't know how this story will end. Uh, I think it's going to end with the ultimate L conjectures being true, but having been in this game for 40 years or longer and seeing that many times things don't turn out the way you think, uh, I do think that however it does end, it will be beautiful. So I guess I'm not quite sure how this fits in science for sustainable development, but I will say one thing. Set theory and the truths that we have discovered, they're not truths about the physical world. So set theory gives a kind of arena where one can explore truth beyond the world around us. And there's another thing I'm absolutely confident of. However we develop set theory, it cannot be weaponized. So we don't have to worry about uh, negative consequences for society from set theory. Uh, so uh, is it useful for anything? Well, is knowledge useful? I mean, I think a robust investigation into truth that transcends the physical world, that's an interesting thing. And it, it I think, enlarges the spirit. Thank you. The questions will be after all talks. Our next. Our next uh, lecture is by Vladimir Kekelice, and uh, the title of his lecture is the uh, NISA project. <coughs> Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to express my gratitude to organizers for the invitation and for the opportunity to give a short presentation on the NICA project. NICA is nucleotron-based ion collider facility, which is uh, under the development implementation in the international organization Joint Institute for Nuclear Research at Bubna. And main goals is to study hot and dense nuclear matter, for example, how quarks and gluons are clustering hadrons, protons, neutrons, etc. And to study nuclear spin structure, how the spin of protons and neutrons are composed of quarks and gluons, and some infrastructure to provide for applied research. 
to reach these goals, it was necessary to upgrade existing accelerator facility and construct collider to provide collisions of ion species from proton to gold at the energy range up to 11 GeV and polarized protons and neutrons up to energy range 27 GeV in the center of mass. And three detectors, baryon matter at nucleotron, working at the fixed target, multipurpose detector, MPD, and spin physics detectors, both installed at the collider interaction points. Strong interactions play a central role in particle physics and are well described by so-called QCD, quantum chromodynamic, chromodynamic theory. But questions remain. Long distance phenomena, for example, confinement, how quarks are confined in neutrons and to, to any, any hadrons. Collective behavior in extreme conditions, high temperature, high density, reliable predictions for non-perturbative mode, which is not the case in, 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 in high energy physics. Is it possible to describe phenomena on the border of the low and high energy from the first principles of QCD? And how fast moving quarks and gluons are grouped in colorless, sing color singlet hadrons? QCD lattice calculations predict transitions of matter in quark gluon plasma, in which partons are not confined, so-called it's uh, asymptotic freedom, and chiral symmetry is restored. Future progress will be based on the diversified research program with close interactions of the theoretical achievements and new experimental measurements, in, in, mainly in the new region less explored. Sorry. So this is a phase diagram. On this axis, you see the temperature or energy. This axis indicates the baryon density. And this line indicates the phase transition the, from the gas, hadron gas, ordinary nucleons, protons, or mesons, to bricks of the universe, quarks and gluons. How this transition happens in the region of maximum baryon density? This is the mission of NICA. NICA aims to study QCD diagram in the region of the high baryon density, where it is expected transition from baryonic to proton states, parton states, the first order phase transition, and the possible critical endpoint. Because this crossover and this is a, could be a first order phase transition, then we should have somewhere the second order court, uh, phase transition or or so-called critical endpoint. Transmission from baryonic dominance to meson dominance, lattice QCD way is not applicable. Because QCD works in low density in this region, it's, it's very well predicts what happens at CERN High Energy or in Brookhaven National Lab at the Rig Collider, but less predictable for the region of high baryon density, where NICA is going to explore this region. It's also a content with astrophysical research, which is being intensively developed and may raise new questions for us. Because high baryonic density, what was expected in the core of a neutron stars? Probably some similarity what happens in the neutron stars in the, in the region where we have transition from the hadronic gas to the gluons. NICA complements existing and planned research, CIS 100 FAIR, Germany, LHC at CERN, and will be necessarily continuation and significant expansion of the research at the RIC beam energy scan due to the variety of systems and energy and the accuracy, because the statistics we are planning much higher than it was done in the beam energy scan at RIC. So, civil construction site just seven years ago, you could see the groundbreaking ceremony with the presence of the professor David Gross, the Nobel, he got Nobel Prize for the, um, explaining the asymptotic freedom together with uh, Wilczek and, uh, and other scientists. And how it looks today, you could see the collider ring in the circumference of uh, half a kilometer and two interaction points where two detectors will be installed, multipurpose detector and spin physics detector. A NICA complex is a flagship project of Joint Institute for Nuclear Research. It will be put in operation in the next year. In the coming, deca coming decades, a wide set of ion beams in the energy range up to 11 GeV per unit for gold 
and 27 GeV will be for protons will be available for the fixed target and collider experiment as well as for applied research. And this facility should be used by the global scientific community of users from the GNR member states and the other countries. You could see the tunnel where magnets at the stage of installation. We are producing superconducting magnets in, 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 in our facility, and you could see the stage of the production. Almost more than 90% of all the magnetic optics already produced, and there is the stage of installation. installation. We have several collaborations. Multipurpose detector already collected collaboration of almost of 500 scientists from 35 centers. 11 countries and GNR. You could see the number of countries and institutions representing of this country. And you could see the magnet assembly, superconducting big magnet, the basement of this detector in the MPD hall, and just we are in the position of the adjusted yoke and the installation of the, uh, of the coil, superconducting coil. And we expect soon cryogenic test and the magnetic field measurement, which is critical, and we hope that our Serbian colleagues will help us in this issue. You could see just an example of production of the some elements of the detector, the time projection chamber, time of light system, electromagnetic colorimeter, etc. The production stage is close to the completion, and we expect that assembly will be completed the next year, and we will start beam interaction and, 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 and first events will be recorded. Several MPD physical groups are already organized and working around the world, preparing, simulating and preparing for this uh, uh, data taking and, and an analysis of what will be had. Another program is uh, devoted to the spin structure of the nucleon because up to now it's not clear how the spin of nucleon and proton is composed of the gluons and the quarks. Quarks are contributing only one third of the spin, and the gluon's contribution is still less, less studied, and we are planning, due to some processes, you could see this diagram, charmony, open charm, prom protons, which we are planning to study, to overcome this so-called spin crisis, which several decades is not yet solved. This is slightly different physics, but very interesting as well, contributing to the strong interactions. The collaboration of the SPD is already counting almost 30, uh, 300 participants from the 12 countries you could see here, including the Czech and Poland. Unfortunately, from the MPD, Poland, Czech and Germany left due to the, under the pressure of the politicians. It's a pity that scientists left already did. They did a lot, contributed a lot, and now they have an opportunity to continue these studies. The spin detector would be staged as any other detectors. You could see how we are planning to do. At the beginning, it would be rather simple, and the simple detector just providing 3D modeling of the nucleon. At the next stages, it would be more sophisticated to do the whole program, which uh, are planned by these collaborations. Some infrastructure is already almost completed because we need the power almost more than slightly for 400 megawatts. Um, almost 20 substations which split this uh, energy among uh, the facilities are already done. You could see the factory which was put in operation to produce superconducting magnets, not only for our facility, but as well we, we did some production for the fair Germany, but now they unfortunately does not require anymore. And we, we, we are ready to continue our production for supply for our friends in, 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 in the GSI, but Unfortunately, it's up to now blocked for a few months, we hope. And the cryogenic infrastructure is as well developed because it will provide almost 200 liquid helium per hour, which is um, uh, equivalent to capacity in, in, in cold at 10 kilowatt at the temperature of 4.5 Kelvin. And some very advanced detectors based on the silicon sensors are developed with the help, with a close cooperation with CERN, GSI, and several China institutions. This is very specific so-called mon monolithic active pixel systems, which comprises billions of pixels and covers a large area, several square meters, and uh, have very high spatial resolutions, almost five, seven microns. 
and low material budget, which is very essential to have no parasitic interactions inside the detector. The first experiment has been already started with a fixed target because the first accelerator in the chain of accelerators of the Nika complex has been put in operation just in the December last year. This is a, probably one in the world's accelerators, superconducting synchrotron, which was put in operation. It's rather medium size, 20, uh, 250 meters circumference, but it was working very perfectly. You could see how the VC similarity of the extracted beams is, have been reached, introducing so-called stochastic uh, noise, which all these spikes reduces to the very stable beam. And the beam is extracted from the booster, from the LINAC, etc., to the experimental area with several setups. This is 160 meters to here. And the first experiment has been already collected data in this January. This is so-called um, SRC. SRC is strong range uh, correlations with the participation of many institutions from the United States, from the Europe, and from, uh, from Israel and, and Joint Institute as well. The, this collaboration did very exciting, very interesting job because they collected uh, millions of events and uh, to study so-called short range correlations pairs. What it means, in any nuclei, couple of nucleons, protons or neutrons, creates such a pair that 20% of them exceed the normal movement inside so-called Fermi movement. And those couple of neutrons have the general um, uh, momentum close to the zero, but the opposite momentum are very high. And to study how the nucleons are binded in the, uh, are binded in the nuclei, it's very interesting to study such, such a couples of neutrons. And the idea was to use so-called uh, inverse kinematics. It means that the nuclei should be hit by protons in ordinary experiments, which uh, knock out a couple of neutrons, spectator, and the rest of the nuclei. But it's very difficult to detect all the products of this reaction. Inverse kinematics means that proton is stable, hydrogen target, and the nuclei hits this proton, then all the products go into the detector and we have inclusive reactions. First experiment was done. This idea was very well accepted by the community and, and it was already published in, in Nature. And the first run in, in, in March indicated the feasibility of this study and this year it was collected, they were collected almost 200 million triggers to events with very good quality. And they expect for the first time to see probably 100 events not seen before by any other detectors and to, to go deep inside to shed light on this idea how this couple of protons extending the ordinary momenta uh, behave. So another project which starts just in a in, 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 in couple of weeks. This is a baryon meta at nucleotron dedicated to study high density baryonic matter, but at the lower energy with a fixed target experiment. And the program is to study equation of state or symmetric equation of, uh, of state for symmetric matter at high density, some energy which describes the symmetry at high baryonic density to see hypernuclei phase transition from hadronic to proton matter. And you could see in this diagram, this is the energy of the beam, and, and this is the frequency of interaction, so how much statistics could be collected. And this is beam energy scan of the Brookhaven lab. This is MPD, and this you could see baryonic matter at nucleotron, which already starts data taking. And you could see the elapsed time of the interaction of the heavy nuclei, and how much baryonic density could be reached this is a five. This is a level of five times to ordinary baryon, uh, ordinary nuclear density in the ordinary nuclei. So it could be reached five times, even for the, if the BM at ten at ten times ordinary density. The same density exists as I told you in the core of the neutron stars. So we expect that the, all the 
uh, studies would be competitive. You could see in this table how many observables could be observed by the BMTN, which has will start just just in this in a couple of weeks the data taking, and how it was collected in other experiments. And the prediction is to see indeed very well the transition at high baryonic density. This is just indication, the simulation, how well the spectators or, or observables, uh, um, uh, cairn decays, uh, xi decays, and uh, triton decays could be, could, be, could be seen by this setup. As a statistic, which is expected just in, in this autumn, autumn run, you could see here it's almost the same statistics, which was collected just recently at Brookhaven Lab by B Manager Scan program. So another field which will be studied, which will be developed at, at, at the NICA facility is applied research. We have already several extracted beam for the C irradiation of the chips, so-called Sochi station, iron beam up to 3 MeV per unit. And the, we have a extracted beam for the investigation of medical biological objects, which would, the uh, uh, beam would be provided with a variety of the ions uh, to the target at the, up to the level of 400 MeV per unit. And recently, the collaboration was founded called Ariadna, Applied Research Infrastructure for Advanced, uh, advanced Development at the NICA facility. And these collaborations already expressed a very high interest to, to really to come and to, to provide, to bring the facilities to irradiate bio beams and to study the materials, the biological objects, etc. As a conclusion, I could say that NICA complex has the potential to conduct competitive research of topological issues of strong interactions, including the phase transition in the less explored region of the QCD phase diagram and spin physics. A number of technologies were developed and implemented during the design and construction of the NICA complex that will allow obtaining high precision experimental data both in fundamental and applied research. Several inter international collaborations have been created and are successfully developing to conduct research at the NICA complex. Vinci Institute for Nuclear Research of Nuclear Science in Belgrade has joined the MPD collaboration, aimed at advanced research of heavy ion collisions. Thank you for your attention. And for the day one, I will reply on your questions. Our next lecture is, I think, online by Francois Legare. And the title of our lecture is Ultrafast Science and Technology at the Advanced Laser Light Source. Please. Okay, hello. Do you hear me well? Okay, just to confirm, do you hear me well? Okay. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I'm sorry if I could not attend in person. So my name is uh, Francois Legare. I'm the scientific director of the Advanced Laser Light Source near Montreal in a small town called Varennes in Canada. Before discussing the research that is performed at ALS, I want to introduce you to a network of high power laser facilities open to users, LaserNet US. LaserNet US is funded by the US Department of Energy and is composed of 10 high peak power laser facilities in North America with one in Canada and nine in the United States. The LaserNet US network, its mission is to promote high intensity laser science and applications by advancing the frontiers of laser science research providing students and scientists with broad access to unique facilities and enabling technologies <clears throat> and fostering collaborations among researchers in related fields around the world. On the left is the figure with 
all the facilities part of LaserNet US with pulse energy on the Y axis and pulse duration on the X axis. So if your laser system delivers 100 femtosecond pulse duration, you need 100 joules of energy to reach one petawatt of peak power. You can see that within the LaserNet US, there's a wide variety of pulse duration available with nearly petawatt peak power. There's a little square in brown green. This is 750 terawatt of peak power. This is the laser system based at ALS with 13 joules per laser pulse with 17 femtosecond pulse duration. Just want to note that if we will turn on all the power plants in the world sim simultaneously, we will have 10 terawatt of power. So the fact is with lasers, we have access to very, very short pulse duration, enabling very high peak power, since peak power is given by energy divided by pulse duration. The key technology for high power laser science has been developed and uh, imagined by Donna Strickland and Gerard Mou. They got the Nobel Prize of Physics in 2018 for the technique called chirp pulse amplification that has enabled a wide range of scientific applications as well as societal and industrial ones. The key idea is rather simple. You take a laser delivering ultra short pulses an oscillator, typically nanojoules of energy per pulse at 80 megahertz repetition rate. You stretch the laser pulse to few hundreds of picoseconds, even nanosecond pulse duration. Then this stretch pulse in time is further amplified by amplifiers, and then using a set of grating, the famous grating compressor, all the colors are put back in phase to get an ultra short light pulse. So this is the key technology that enables researchers today to generate petawatt peak power and even more. There are three ingredients to reach high peak laser intensity. Intensity is simply energy divided by duration times the surface on which the laser light is focused. Today's laser Energy is in the range of tens of joules and even hundred joules of energy per laser pulse. Pulse duration is about tens of femtosecond, with one femtosecond being one ten to the minus fifteen seconds. So if you take ten joules within ten femtosecond, this is a petawatt of peak power. Now, by focusing the laser light on a diffraction limited spot size given by the, the wavelength of the laser, we can reach intensities in the range of 10 to the 22, 20 to the 23 watts per centimeter square. So this gives a unique tool to explore light matter interaction phenomena. The last paper I have seen about peak intensity record was published in 2019 by the group of Chang Inan in South Korea at the Gwangju Institute of Science and Technology. They have demonstrated 5.5 10 to the 22 watts per centimeter square. At all, we have a laser system at 750 terawatt, and by controlling very well, the spatial properties of the beam, we believe we can reach 10 to the 23 watts per centimeter square. And then in Europe, with the extreme light infrastructure, there will be operational 10 petawatt laser system really soon. And this will enable intensity above 10 to the 24 watts per centimeter square. So on the left, so in 1985, the chirp pulse amplification technique was discovered by Moru in Strickland. And nowadays we are in the range, I mean, for the last 10 years, it has not increased significantly. Unfortunately, it doesn't continue as a straight line. We are at about, as I said, 10 to the 23. 
My expertise is mostly in the range of 10 to 15 to 20, 10 to 20. This is the region where we can accelerate electrons and where we can generate soft to hard X-rays. But of course, there are people interested to reach really high peak intensity to do, for example, uh, QED experiments such as four wave mixing in vacuum and uh, all kind of experiments uh, related to this. And the Schwinger limit is at 10 to the 29 watts per centimeter square. But again, this is not my field of expertise. I'm, I work mostly in the region in the regime of bound electrons and relativistic optics. Okay, uh, my training uh, as an undergrad student was in chemistry. So for sure I have a bias. Uh, I believe that one of the best outcome of laser science and high peak power lasers is the ability to generate a rainbow of frequencies from the terahertz to the hard X-ray spectral range for various applications in physics, chemistry, and biology. So from the NEV photon energy to tens of keV. I want to highlight two processes to get those photons, the process of high harmonic generation with the key benefits of photons from 10 to 500 eV, spatially and temporally coherent beam with attosecond pulse duration. For more details, I suggest you to read the paper in Nature Physics. And then another process that requires more peak power, the laser wave field electron acceleration method for the generation of hard X-ray beta tron radiation. We get photons from keV to about 100 keV, spatially coherent with sub 10 femtosecond pulse duration. So all has been recognized in 2022 by the federal government as a national user facility. We can provide light from the terahertz to the hard X-rays as well as high energy electrons. We have two laser platforms, one being the laboratory for petawatt peak power laser science and application, and one being the laboratory for high average power lasers for imaging and controlling complex systems. We have seven end stations for various applications from physics, chemistry, and biology, including hard X-ray phase contrast imaging, high energy proton beamline, time resolve angular resolve photoelectron spectroscopy for the characterization of quantum materials, cold trumps for single molecule imaging detection, compressed ultrafast microscopy for biomedical imaging. We have high harmonics based X-ray sources in various mid infrared and terahertz sources. As in a nutshell, we are a facility open to users from academic, government, and industry. We develop advanced uh, science and technology through multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research. And from fundamental science, we develop innovative light-based technologies. And I want to highlight two things that users are doing at all. For example, we have a group from the University of Saskatchewan doing plant imaging with hard X-rays. Their goal is to take the X-rays produced by the lasers to see how the roots are growing in the soil. This is plant biologists. They want to develop new crops for sustainable agriculture. And I want to. I have a colleague who wants to develop an innovative uh, detection system based on mid infrared light for uh, detection of microplastics. So environmental science. Here I want to give few example of. Uh, my science that was performed at ALS in the recent years. My colleague, Marc Gauthier, who is the uh, interim director of uh, my research center at INRS, has demonstrated that terahertz radiation enabled to selectively break DNA assemblies. So DNA assemblies are more uh, and more used for various applications uh, in biomedicine. And typically to disassemble DNA molecules, we use temperature. The problem is when you increase the temperature, you destroy or you break all the biomolecules. What they have shown in the paper published in 2019 in the Journal of American Chemical Society is that terahertz allow, terahertz radiation allows to selectively um, disassemble DNA without having any other effects on plasmid proteins and enzymes. Then I have a young colleague from the University of Alberta, recently hired, Amina Usen, 
she's coming at the facility for using X-ray diagnostics for additive image, additive manufacturing. They want to track pores inside metal alloys under material deformation. This is very important in the perspective of building new robust materials. And then we do fundamental science. My colleague, Haida Ibrahim, research associate at the Advanced Laser Light Source and adjunct professor at University of Ottawa, has demonstrated that with a technique called Coulomb Explosion Imaging, it is possible to film in real time statistical processes under photodecision of formaldehyde. So typically, when we use lasers to study uh, uh, ultra-fast dynamics in molecules, we study well-defined coherent wave packet. This is the first paper that demonstrates the ability to image and capture statistical molecular processes. And then one of my, now I want to move a little bit more in the research performed by my group. One of my former PhD student, Reza Safai, has demonstrated a novel approach to reduce the pulse duration of lasers called multidimensional solitary states. So using a sub-picosecond laser, and I want to say it clearly, sub-picosecond, so quite long pulses for ultra-fast people, um, there are many companies in Europe, in Europe developing uh, very well robust sub-picosecond laser system. We can take those lasers coupled to an olopore fiber. It's basically simply a glass tube inside which we put some gas molecules, in this case nitrogen, and then through a process called stimulated Raman scattering and multimodal propagation in the olopore fiber, we can broaden the input spectra quite significantly towards the red. And at the output of the olopore fiber, by simply propagating in a simple piece of glass, we can generate very short pulses, about 10 femtoseconds. So we can take very robust picosecond laser system and convert them very efficiently to 10 femtosecond lasers. And then with a former uh, group member uh, of my group who has started a spin-off company called FuCycle, we are developing this olopore fiber um, system as a commercial uh, system for the generation of ultra-short laser pulses. So basically we take, instead of a rigid holopore fiber, we take a stretch holopore fiber that we stretch like a cord in a guitar, and we can generate with this very high energy infrared laser pulses. And with those infrared pulses, we can generate sub 10 femtosecond soft X-ray pulses in the water window spectral range for time resolved chemical dynamics. We can generate ultra short electron bunches for diffraction imaging. And more recently, and I believe this is very interesting work performed by a postdoc of my group and with the collaborators, Simon Vallier, by focusing this laser to on, on a very spot size, simply in air, we can generate very high dose rate ionizing radiation. If you are at a meter from the source, within a second, you take your annual dose of electron and X-ray radiation. And we believe that this source will be of interest to look at or to investigate flash radiotherapy. And here, of course, applications in biology and medicine. And then we are continuously developing uh, laser technologies. I, want, I, will, I will be brief. Uh, instead of amplifying the pulses in the time domain, we amplify here the pulse in the frequency domain. So we take the laser pulse, we go on a grating, we collimate with a mirror, we bring here all the frequencies of the laser, like in a piano, so where we have access to all the frequencies, and we can then amplify these colors individually with a very high peak power picosecond laser, and then we recombine all these colors in a single beam, but then amplify. And our goal is to generate 50 millijoule laser in the infrared and mid-infrared spectral range by 2025 at kilohertz repetition rate. 
I want to highlight to all of you, if you are interested, you can go on the ALS website. We have produced the 2022 to 2027 strategic plan in which we address three strategic goals to facilitate the access to the facility. So you are welcome to contact me if you want to use lasers. Um, starting in April 2023, we will be able to provide almost free access to the facility while right now there are major user fees. So thanks to the federal government of Canada, we now have funding starting in 2023, in 2023 to welcome the community for using the laser facility. We want to bring the Canadian community together and bring collaborators from abroad to excel internationally and train the next generation workforce. And we want to support the Canada's innovation sectors to the development and commercialization of novel technologies. And in terms of sustainable development, what we have shown to the federal funding agency is how high power lasers can enable high impact research for the five innovation sectors of Canada, which are information and communication technology, advanced manufacturing, health and life science, agriculture and environment, natural resources and energy, I have already shown to you uh, some research along these lines today. So currently, most of our users are coming from those fields of research, condensed matter, physical chemistry, physical engineering, optics and photonics, and material science. But by, easing, uh, by making the access to the facility easier, we are convinced that we can bring way more people from different research fields and then all work together to have impact on important innovation sectors to, uh, uh, for, of course, sustainable development. So I want to thank all the funding agencies and in, I want to thank also all the technical members of the ALS technical team. Without them, we will not be able to do research. Thank you so much for your attention. Now we have a, a discussion part. Uh, we'll go by order. I say the first speaker, second, third. We have approximately 30 minutes. So we start with the questions for Hugh Woody. because unfortunately I work too late. But, uh, can, I mean, can you speculate or can you tell us, um, let's say for the, uh, the uh, confirmation of the hypothesis for, uh, you know, that uh, in sort of uh, the action, um, uh, if, if let's say you prove that it is not true, what are the implications? And, and if you prove that this is false, what are the implications? Have you, can you tell us a little bit, give us some insights about that? Um, I'm sorry, the implications? If I understood it correctly, what would be implication from the truth of CH and the falsity of CH? Yeah. Well, or the falsity. Um, <laughs> no. CH has, we know CH, if the continuum hypothesis is true, has many consequences. Uh, if the continuum hypothesis is false, that's more complicated because it doesn't tell you how big the infinity of the reals are. So it's, it's in some sense less information. Um, so, it's, so it's a hard question to answer. Uh, the running contender for the size of the continuum in the context that the continuum hypothesis is false is actually the second uh, infinity. And in fact, 20 years ago, I advocated that view quite strongly. But a nice thing about working on an unsolvable problem is you can change your mind, right? Because it's not a proof. Uh, so I, I think um, there's no easy answer to your question. Uh, uh, it'll depend on the nature of the solution, especially if the continuum hypothesis is false. Presumably, 
the sharpening of our conception of the universe of sets that leads us to the continuum hypothesis is false will reveal a lot of other structure. And until we see that, it's hard to say. Okay. Can I ask a follow-up question? One more, okay. Do we have the mathematics to deal with two infinities? I, as, a, when I, as a mathematician, as an undergraduate mathematician, we have one infinity. Our mathematics of today, how are we are going to uh, alter to represent a second infinity? Well, that's how I get it. I mean, that's the surprise of set theory, that when you explore the conception of mathematical infinity in a precise setting where you can do that exploration. It's not vague. It's, a, it's an area of mathematics. Maybe you get to Cantor's result that infinity comes in different sizes. Is that relevant to other areas of mathematics? We don't know yet. Um, you know, that's, that's a mystery that will... will um, I mean, the trouble in mathematics now, largely, though that has changed, partly uh, due to Stavos' work, if a mathematician encounters an issue of infinity in their problem, typically it's whether it's, they have some mathematical thing and they realize it involves infinity. So they go down the hall and if they're lucky, there's a set theorist there. And they ask the set theorist, well, what's the answer to this question? And unfortunately, most of the time, the set theorist will think for a while and then say, what answer would you like? Because it tends to be either independent. Well, that's not terribly useful <laughs> in terms of development. Once we settle CH, then the set theorist will be able to say yes or no, depending on how that couples into the continuum hypothesis. Um, so I, I have a question for Francois Legare. Is that okay? Is that uh, the third okay. speaker. Okay. Okay. okay thank you, sure. Francois yes, Luc Berger speaking. Uh, I want, thank you very much Wayne, for the nice talk. Uh, I was wondering about the terahertz activities uh, you mentioned, and uh, more particularly the use of terahertz fields for investigating the DNA assembly disassembly processes. Uh, have you an idea of the field strength of the terrace process you generate? And behind my question, there is, I mean, are you using some relativistically driven mechanisms for producing these terrace process? Or do not, you perhaps do not need to have a relativistic pulses? No, so, okay. Um, I have not been involved in this specific work. But those terahertz pulses, uh, they have been generated by the team of uh, my colleague, Professor Tsunio Kiyosaki, uh, using um, conventional techniques, not based on... Uh, on um, Wake field uh, generation or, or query so transition. I expect they were probably in the range of a few hundreds of kilo electron volts fields per centimeter, uh, so a few hundred um, kilovolts per centimeters of field. This is my expectation. So, okay, so there is no the, the, safety. The, I mean, the standard terahertz source that we have in ALS, uh, probably whether on, um, I think they are using the zinc telluride or uh, using those photo antenna, but I'm not 100% sure. For sure, this is discussed in the Jack's paper, but no, it's not like gigantic, gigantic terahertz field. It's quite modest uh, terahertz field, and this is also one. The reason why I think this work is really interesting is since they are using modest terahertz field from a hundred hertz lasers. In the future, those terahertz field we could generate them at ten kilohertz or even more. So we could really. Um, Control have a nice DNA. have a nice signal over noise ratio, for instance, if you have. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Okay. Thank you, François. Thank you. 
Yes, I also have a question for Francois. Uh, I'm very much interested in knowing what kind of, of fluxes you're able to get in the water window. Many years ago, we developed a doubly reflecting Schwarzschild multilayer water window imaging X-ray microscope, but we couldn't get good high-intensity sources. Uh, this has profound applications for studying living microorganisms uh, in, in this very important water window. Could you tell me what the current state of the art is in the fluxes you're able to get, and have you been developing uh, uh, multilayer X-ray optical systems to couple with this? Okay, no, we are not developing optics uh, for this. Uh, we rely completely on uh, buying from uh, companies. Uh, so if you are interested, you could contact me. I'm really much interested to work with people who have expertise with the X-ray optics. Uh, regarding your questions, so um, I do remember, uh, with, okay, from 300 EV to 500 EV, we had about 10 to the 6 photons per laser shot at that time, meaning 10 to the 8 photons per second, given that the laser was running at 100 Hertz repetition rate. Now, with the funding that we got in 2017, we are upgrading our laser systems with high average power ytterbium. And I believe that within an horizon of two years, we could get to 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11 photons per second over the entire water window spectral range. <coughs> Michel Spiro, president of uh, IUPAP, the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics, and chair of the steering committee of uh, IYBSSD. I have a question for the three, three speakers. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, you have an idea of what I will ask. In mathematics, in nuclear physics, and I think also in high intensity lasers, this is where the gender gap is the highest, uh, uh, unfortunately. Do you have a way to measure it and to take measure to, redu to reduce it in your, your respective field? And we can see that from the audience, that the gender gap is, is huge. So, uh, I did, didn't understand finally. What's the gap you're talking about? The question, the question is, is the there are not, there are very few women both ah, mathematics women. I see. In, the gender, uh, in nuclear physics. The gender balance, you mean. The gender balance. And I think also in high-intensity uh, high lasers and also in this audience. How do you explain that and what are the measures that you can take in order to reduce this gender gap? Thank you. It's a very nice question because gender balance is very principal to, to really put the most of power of all the humanity to, to reach the scientific goals. In our cases, we are trying our best and we have, because the collaborations, mainly the uh, management of collaboration is a principle of election. And we have several, at least we have in the BMA 10, the, uh, the detector coordinator, the lady. In some other, we are, we are trying to, to give the opportunity for the occupying the high level position in the collaborations in, in many other issues related to our science and, and doing our best to invite ladies for that. But not always happens because uh, you see that traditionally ladies are going to the human, humanitarian uh, spe specialities. Probably Italian are some exclusions. I know many Italian women who, who dedicate study to physics, but not in other countries so much as I, it's, it's my experience, but in our cases, we are doing our best in, in this direction. Well, yes, we do have an imbalance, but we make progress. Uh, at Harvard, of the senior faculty, the last five senior faculty appointments, three were women. So I think that's important. It provides role models for the students and so forth. Also point out that uh, two of the last uh, eight fields medalists were women. So, but, you know, there's, 
it's, it's a complicated problem. It's obviously you don't want to lose talent. And the question is, where is the talent going and why? And just, you know, I think we are making progress, but we have a long way to go. I agree. Uh, I'm keenly aware of it. I have three daughters. Okay, so it's now, I think it's my turn now. So I've put back the slides. Um, the reason for this is, well, uh, as the previous speaker said, it's a complex question. Um, I have a daughter of eight years old. Um, she wants to become an astrophysicist. And she asked me the question because she's reading a book about astrophysicists and she sees mostly male. Um, astrophysicist and she asked me whether a woman can become an astrophysicist and I said yes obviously and I gave her the example of Victoria Carpi professor at McGill University so um, it's really important to provide role models um, but the role models like women that succeed in science um, I in my case for example I strongly encourage PhD students in my group, women, uh, to go to high school and primary school to show to the little girls that it's possible to become a physicist as a woman. So I think there is something to do with education at primary and high school level. And then me as the scientific director of ALS, of course, I cannot spend every day of my life at the, at the schools. But one thing I can do, it's well known that women and also underrepresented groups, at least in Canada, they, they are in a higher proportion at the early career research stage. So if you look at early careers, there's more women in physics and also underrepresented groups. When we have proposed to the funding agency uh, funding to be considered as a national facility, one of the goals that we have identified was to facilitate access to the facility. To give you an idea, right now, to access the high peak power laser system, it is $6,500 per week, and you need several weeks to achieve one experiment. So I, we said to the funding agency, if you give us funding, we will divide by four the user fees. So instead of six, of 6,500, it will be 1650 per week. And then it will be affordable for most researchers in Canada. And on top of this, we guarantee that 25 persons of the beam time will be given to researchers that are early career scientists. And we believe that to this, we will be able to attract young researchers where women, and members of underrepresented groups have a higher proportion. And then by succeeding in science, I hope that they will convince young people, primary school and high school, to also go in science. In your lecture, uh, you didn't uh, mention uh, Aleph zero and Aleph no one. Can it be in some way uh, input in Hilbert's first problem as well as uh, the axiom of choice? Because as far as I remember, we learned a lot of Aleph zero and Aleph one. Can you, could you explain? Um, well, if, if you don't have the axiom of choice, then the cardinality of the reals could be something other than an aleph. So the problem of the continuum hypothesis comes from the fact that the cardinality of the reals is a cardinality of an ordinal, and then it's which one. So uh, an approach, if I understand your question, might be to solve the problem by making it meaningless and give up on the axiom of choice. And there was an attempt in the early 60s along that route. There's something called the axiom of determinacy, which was proposed as an alternative to the axiom of choice for the study of the sets of reals. 
But in the modern view, uh, it, it, we don't view it that way. I mean, I think the axiom of choice is an interesting axiom. It doesn't, to me anyway, flow from the initial conception of the universe of sets, yet the universe of sets can be a very chaotic place without the axiom of choice. And so we tend to assume it, but I think we don't have a good explanation for why the axiom of choice is true. The ultimate Al picture will give a, an explanation for the axiom of choice. So that's where we are. Question for Vladimir. Um, so you talked about um, uh, the accelerator technology, um, which is um, kind of increasing, but albeit uh, at a higher, higher sort of obstacles to jump. And so some uh, another approach is, in a sense, as you also had in your slides, to look, you know, in a sense, in astrophysics. Yes. And so, and typically now these are looked as two independent when one could think is there an opportunity when you in a sense observe let's say something through astrophysics to in a sense focus your experiments and vice versa I think you started saying something uh, but no, I don't think you quite addressed that yes thank you very good question indeed the particle physics and the astrophysics it's a two side on one universal science because the nature has the same law which uh, rules astrophysics and microscopic dynamics. It's the same because the same power, the same forces, and having two opposite possibilities to, a, a, to attach the same universe laws, it's a great opportunity because now, in the old days, astrophysics and, and the particle physics became united in, in many science. In our cases, because high baryonic density, we reach this high density by colliding very heavy ions to say gold to gold at specific energy, not too high, not too low. We should just tune the energy at a certain moment to create very dense baryonic density when 400 nucleons are are pushed in such a way to create a super high density. The same happens in the neutron star, but not by the electromagnetic forces which collides, but by the gravitational forces. Because if super heavy neutron star is so great, so, so large, then in the core you have density 10 times more than ordinary density of the nuclei in the, in, in the ordinary nuclei. We, we reach the same but colliding heavy ions. And what happens inside? Because in astrophysics, you could see the shift of the phase when collides two neutrons, creating two heavy neutron stars. And the shifts of the phases indicate somehow the nature inside the core. And now we are trying to see how the phases are shifted in during the collapses and what could be related, some modeling theoreticians are creating some models on the other side to see what could happen in our cases and how we can predict what could be happen in the collapses of the, of the, of the neutron stars. So, yeah, yes, the, um, and I appreciate explaining. So the idea is that in the stars you have more macroscopic, yes. you know, it's more indirect. And in, uh, through the colliders you have a more more detail, more, more microscopic. Detail, more microscopic. So the idea would be if you have an, a kind of a representation of the force, like the nuclear force, which we, think we don't know, right? And you do a lot. So can you, in a sense, extrapolate from, from that to see if the physics of the, that we observe in the collapsing neutron star are explained? Or, and also for the, the other side, would be to look at the neutron star and then try to interpolate down to the. Uh, so, is this done? Have, have enough studies been conducted along that way? Yes, the studies are done, but not directly. You, you cannot directly predict from the microscopic mm -hmm. to the microsco microscopic to the macroscopic mm -hmm. directly. But some theory which trying to really to touch to each other all, all the ideas because the same forces 
are in power, but in different conditions. Uh, and this is unity of the universe, which, and, and, and as soon as theoreticians will succeed to have the same theory for gravitational waves and for uh, standard model, then we probably would be directly touching to each other, but not yet. But, but, but the relation exists, but not direct, through some modeling, some theory. Okay, thank you. For uh, Budin, uh, why uh, arguments by uh, by large cardinals are less formal than ZFC arguments because it's also some formal system? And uh, what are criteria for adopting some mathematical principles? That's an excellent question and a complicated one to answer. Um, I take the position that we're trying to sharpen our conception of the universe of sets. It's not a random selection of axioms. If it were, it's all number theory. You just explore consequences of this axiom or not or, or another. But there's a methodology in set theory where I think we incorporate can incorporate new axioms into the universe of sets, and we've done so. Um, uh, that's you know, it's not just here is that you know a list of axioms. Choose one at a time and explore its consequences. You explore the landscape of possibilities, combined with your in, intuitions that initially led you to conceive of the universe of sets, and it tends to sort it out. The large cardinal axioms tend to fall into a well-ordered hierarchy by and large. Uh, there are very few examples of incompatible axioms, so that's, that's all you can do. Um, uh, and that's, you know, one could take the view that we are making random choices, it's a human fiction, but, you know, the large cardinal axioms are very sensitive. If you don't have the conception of their formulation in the context of set theory and view them as just formal sentences, change that sentence a little bit, you get an inconsistent axiom. So the question is, how is it that we're able to pick those axioms that don't fall? It has not yet happened, essentially, that a large cardinal axiom has been discovered and initially vetted, and then later shown to be in a contradiction. So uh, the skeptic has to explain that. You know, maybe, uh, and there's never been an explanation. I mean, remember, I could be wiped out. If, if wooden cardinals are inconsistent, or measurable cardinals are inconsistent, essentially all the theorems I've ever proved are vacuous. I have no meaning. So, you know, I have kind of a vested interest in this. Uh, and. You know, if in 10,000 years those axioms are still not shown to be inconsistent, that's remarkable. I mean, take, take the most famous problem in mathematics, the Riemann hypothesis. Is any number theorist prepared to declare that it's true? It has the same logical complexity as the consistency of, of set theory. And yet, there doesn't seem to be a number of theorists that's prepared to declare it's true. In fact, take the Clay Millennial problem list. You get a million dollars, solve one of, well, I guess now, six problems. The, the Riemann hypothesis is one of those questions. You prove the Riemann hypothesis and publish it and accept it, you get a million dollars. But wait, read the fine print. If you come up with a counterexample to the Riemann hypothesis, you may not get the million. So the scientific advisory board was unwilling to bet a million dollars, not even of their own money, that the Riemann hypothesis was true. Yet, if ZFC is inconsistent, I'll resign my job. You know, so there's something different going on. Why is it that the number theorists 
aren't willing to declare an unsolved problem as true. You know, they've been working on it for a long time. There's a lot of evidence for the truth of the Riemann hypothesis. Yet still, even when it came to the clay problem list, they won't pay off if you come up with a counterexample. Interesting sociological fact. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, let's I think, I think we came uh, very close to the end. We have a few minutes, but I think it's a good place to stop. Am I allowed to ask a question? Uh, I think that you answered. Uh, but uh, there was another, if it's a quick, we have uh, yeah, they're, four they're, minutes. Hope, yeah, thank you. Four minutes. Uh, this is my, a question to Francois. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, the, I was the director of the Air Force Social Scientific Research, and we have a lot of interest in these um, technologies for uh, other reasons that I will not discuss here. But uh, I wanted to ask you, um, have you any projects identified that are looking, in a sense, either for using these new capabilities for new materials or proving, you know, looking into new physics? So new materials and new physics. So in terms of new materials, my answer, we have INRS has hired a colleague of mine, Fabio Boschini, a few years ago to basically develop quantum materials and then to study how we can control the properties of the quantum materials with light matter interaction and then perform the complete characterization using time resolved photo emission spectroscopy. So we are right now, me and him, I have the expertise with lasers, he has expertise with photo emission spectroscopy. We are putting the instrument together and we hope that by the beginning of 2023, we will be able to start uh, characterization uh, for the control of quantum materials. And then in terms of physics, well, I'm a chemist from training, as I said, a chemical physicist. So. For me, the work that was performed by my research associate, Haida Ibrahim, on using time-resolved technique to characterize statistical processes in molecules is really of high interest. Because when you look at chemical dynamics, um, I mean, since the Nobel Prize of Zoel in chemistry, we are often looking at well-defined coherent wave packet, but this is not the reality of how plants absorb light. You know, the light from the sun is clear, is not a laser. So all these processes, of course, there are some wave packet, but they are often defined by statistical, for example, decay from one state to another state. And now, by pushing the repetition rate of our lasers, we will be able to move from this simple molecule that we have studied for maldehyde to more complex systems. And my dream is that one day we will be able to watch these process in biomolecules. So I hope I have answered your questions. Okay, thank you very much for all who have asked questions, and especially the speakers and uh, and we have finished.